so thank you all for being here and, and thank you to Ted and my uh, U Michigan colleagues for, for having me here and to the, uh, uh, the uh, Gileo family for sponsoring this talk. Um, so I wanted to tell you today a story and this is the story of the discovery of gravitational waves and almost all of you have certainly heard that this has been a, a big scientific discovery of the past two years, it's been in and out of the news. What you may not know is that it's been about 100 years in the making. So that, this, that's the story I'm going to tell you today. It's the story of opening a new window into the universe. And I want to upfront tell you that everything I'm going to talk to you about today, whether it's data, instruments, uh, theory, is the work of literally hundreds of scientists who are the members of the LIGO and Virgo uh, collaborations that have put together all the effort that was needed to make this discovery. Now, it's a discovery that shook the world. This is what the Nobel Committee called it when awarding last year's Nobel Prize in Physics to three, these three gentlemen, uh, Ray Weiss on the left from MIT and uh, Kip Thorne and Barry Barish from Caltech. And these will be some of the protagonists of our story today. Not the only ones, but some, okay? Now, because I told you this is opening a new window into the universe, you must surely be asking, well, what's the old window? into the universe. Well, the old window into the universe is something that's very near and dear to us over here who are uh, from the optics community. It's light. And that old window into the universe has given us amazing information about objects like this one. This object is a supernova nova remnant. It is the end product of a star like our own sun. A star like our own sun eventually will run out of nuclear fuel that it burns to shine, its light source turns off, so the radiation pressure of the light pushing outwards turns off, so, and gravity is still pulling it in, and the star implodes on itself in a, a spectacular explosion that sheds some of this material uh, outwards, but mostly it collapses into this little core here. So I hope you all can see this little blue dot in the center. So this is a picture that's a composite made up of, of, uh, of different colors of light. The uh, red uh, and orangish colors are infrared light taken by NASA's Spitzer uh, telescope, a uh, space telescope in the infrared. The blues and greens are visible light taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And then finally, the blues and purples are X-ray emission. And you can see the most energetic e uh, ejecta are towards the edges of this explosion. And this little blue object in the center is visible only in the X-ray. It is a neutron star. It's a really peculiar object. It's an object that has the mass of our sun, but it has a radius of about 10 kilometers. Now, I'll put that in perspective. Our sun has a radius of 700,000 kilometers. So this is an extremely compact, dense object, very massive, uh, lots of gravity in a small volume. Now, if the parent star that, that caused this supernova explosion had been a little bit more massive, maybe three or four times the mass of our sun instead of just one or two times the mass of our sun, its gravity would have caused this neutron star to continue to implode until it became a black hole. So that's lesson number one. Neutron stars and black holes are cousins. Neutron stars are the lighter cousins of black holes. Okay? Now, how might we observe a black hole if it were indeed, uh, if that's what had happened? Well, first of all, we wouldn't necessarily see any emission here, but we might. And let me tell you an, a case in which we might. This is an artist's rendition of a black hole, uh, J165540. And what we see is essentially we know there's a black hole uh, at the center of this object because what we measure in x-rays again is emission that flickers because the black hole is spinning, and we see these jets, which are characteristic of black holes. And the only reason we see this black hole, and it's not just black, is that it is essentially eating up all this gas and dust around it. And as this gas and dust is falling in on the black hole, it heats up and emits an x-rays. So that's how we've seen black holes until now. If they sit in gas and dust and they're accreting, we can see them. If they're lonely black holes in, the, in space, we don't because they give off no light. Now, if we wanted to see them, we could turn on another messenger. We know that these black holes uh, are, are extremely uh, gravitational objects. And that in brings up the, our next messenger uh, for bringing information from the universe, and that's gravity's messenger. 
So what do we know about gravity? Well, at the turn, at the you know, in the 16th and the 17th century, Newton had this extremely successful law, law of gravitation, which all of us have at one point or the other learned in, in our physics classes. It basically says that the two massive objects of mass m1 and m2, they feel a force of attraction that's proportional to their masses and inversely proportional to the square of their distances. Now, Newton himself, successful as this, this formula was in predicting the orbits of planets and apocryphally even why apples fall to the Earth, Newton himself worried about this effect of action at a distance. He asked the question of how does mass one know about mass two? In modern physics uh, jargon, this would be what mediates the interaction between these masses? And that answer didn't come to us till our next hero of gravity, and that was in the early 20th century with Einstein. Now, Einstein told us to stop thinking about gravity as a force. Einstein said gravity is geometry. It is the warpage of space-time, and Einstein's picture of gravity was that all of space-time can be thought of as a sheet, a membrane, and when we put a massive object somewhere on that membrane, it curves. And when we put a, a, a small test particle at the edge of, that, that, the, uh, of this uh, curved space, region of space-time, that test particle will fall towards the massive object because it must follow the curvature of space-time. And Einstein, like Newton, wrote an equation. Now, unlike Newton's equation, Einstein's equation is not just one equation. These indices tell us that it's actually a set of several equations. And in fact, what, benign as it looks, it's one of the most beastly equations ever written. And that brings us to one of the stories, uh, the, the parallel stories here, which is even though Einstein gave us this equation in, in 1916, it has taken almost 100 years, 90 years, to come up with the first exact solutions to this equation. Okay, now Einstein not only told us that space curves around a massive object, Einstein also asked the question about what if the massive object isn't just sitting still? What if it's in an orbit? What if it's accelerating? And in that case, right out of those, his, his equations, in a, in a simplified uh, uh, version of his equations, came the gravitational wave. And here is, is, a, is an, again, an artistic picture of what the gravitational wave would do to our space-time. Here is a pair of neutron stars that may be, or, or black holes, that may be orbiting each other. And very much as you might see two drumsticks rolling on, on the surface of a drum, those those, these orbits set up waves that propagate outwards from the objects that are emitting them. Now, turns out that even though these, these fell squarely out of his theory, Einstein uh, was able to make very firm, did I lose something here? Sorry. Oh, I think I lost something here. That's okay. So I'll tell you uh, a, a, a small little story about, about Einstein uh, and, and gravitational waves. Einstein was actually very ambivalent about gravitational waves. In his original 1916 papers, he actually dismissed them as having no practical purpose. And then in, 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 uh, he not only worried about them because they were so faint, which he knew already by 1916, but he also questioned their very existence. He wondered if they were some artifact of the mathematics rather than something nature would uh, really do. And in fact, in 1936, he actually uh, uh, retracted their, uh, their existence by writing a paper whose title was, Do Gravitational Waves Exist? And if you read the abstract, it, the answer, his answer was no. And then in the same year, in 1936, he retracted the retraction. And then after that, he kind of went silent on gravitational waves. So he himself was ambivalent, and uh, his ambivalence was actually quite justified because in his time, objects like neutron stars and black holes were not known. And in fact, if you looked at what gravitational waves could be emitted by ordinary stars orbiting each other, they would be so, so faint that he was right to think of them as, as, as unworthy. Now, However ambivalent he was, there's something very remarkable about his theory. And the remarkable thing was that he encoded the behavior of space-time and black holes very accurately in his theory. So now we fast forward to 2006. So this is 90 years after Einstein first told us about gravitational waves. And this is a moment in time when we have the first serious breakthroughs 
in solving Einstein's equations for a few, a subset of, of, of exact solutions to or black holes that are orbiting each other. And this came about through the miracle of mathematics, which we've had for hundreds of years, and the miracle of supercomputers, which we haven't had for 100 years. So that was another coming together of, 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 uh, of technologies that were needed to make these discoveries. Now, what you're going to see in this movie is two black holes, and they're orbiting each other. And as they orbit each other, they radiate gravitational waves. Those gravitational waves carry away energy, and that energy comes from the orbit, which means that their orbits are shrinking. They're getting closer and closer to each other, and eventually they'll collide. So you see when they're far apart, these classic funnels of space-time under them are just funnels. But as they get closer to each other, the two funnels start to commingle, and here is the space-time ripples accumulating. As, as, as we measure as a function of time. And then eventually these two black holes, will, will, their horizons will touch in a spectacular storm of space-time warpage. The movie will actually freeze briefly as the, as the two black holes touch. You'll see that the space-time is extremely warped. And down here, that's the maximum of the signal that we'll see. Shortly after that happens, the two black holes have merged together. They wobble a, a little bit, and then they go quiet and live in empty space, never to be seen again, literally. Gravitational waves from this object travel out into the universe. And the beauty of this particular um, uh, simulation is that it is a simulation. This is actually the work of, of solving Einstein's equations in this particular case of two black holes who, who, that are not spinning. So the first time we've had such exact solutions. Now, ba going back to 1967, 68, this man, Kip Thorne, was thinking about what gravitational waves might look like from neutron stars. Now, why is that an important moment in time? That's an important moment in time because in 1967 was the first discovery of neutron stars actually using radio telescopes. And so for the first time, people understood that these objects really could be out there. And if they were, what might the gravitational waves from those, look, from, from those orbiting neutron stars look like? And this was what Kip Thorne came up with. He, he showed that it would be a chirp. But more importantly, he showed, put a scale on it. He told us that for a pair of neutron stars in a galaxy not too far from our own, this would have an amplitude of a part in 10 to the minus 21. Now, even if you're not too scientifically inclined, you will agree that this is a god-awful small number. It's a, it's a decimal point with 20 zeros after it before you can write a one. So now you can see why Einstein was right to be pessimistic. So Thorne tells us, here's what the signal will look like. Here's what its amplitude is. Now in the meantime, we were also the, you know, there was also a, a community thinking about how they might be detected. To think about their detection, we first have to understand what gravitational waves do here on the Earth. And to understand that, we, should, we know that there are ripples of space-time. And in Einstein's theory of general relativity, they actually travel at the speed of light. Now, their most important property for us when we're trying to design a detector is that they stretch and shrink the space-time itself. And in fact, the amount by which they, they stretch and shrink the space-time is this quantity delta L. It's proportional to the amplitude of the wave h and the distance that they tra uh, that uh, the space-time distance through which they travel. So to put a scale on this, we could uh, take a look at a very poor gravitational wave detector, me. I'm a space-time object of, of uh, about uh, size one meter uh, uh, vertically, 1.6 meters to be exact. And if a gravitational wave were to pass through me, with this amplitude that Thorne had already told us about some you know, decades earlier, it would change my height by an amount delta L of 10 to the minus 21. It would change my height by one millionth the size of a single proton. And so it's, again, Einstein was right. This is a really, really faint effect. And he was right to think it could never be measured and it would never be worth anything. But Einstein didn't reckon that this man would show up. This is Ray Weiss. 
And Ray Weiss was uh, again in the in the in the in the uh, late 60s and 1970s. He was at a, a, a professor at MIT, and Ray actually th was working on uh, on atomic uh, uh, fountains at the time. In 1960, the laser was invented, and so he had thought about lasers, and he came up with a, a, uh, a scheme for measuring gravitational waves. He came up with this method, uh, which is a laser interferometer, where you take a laser beam, you split it into two halves on this, this beam splitter, and then it propagates and reflects off one mirror up to the north and one mirror out to the east. And when those light beams come back and recombine on the beam splitter, if all the peaks and troughs of the waves line up, you will, all the light will add up at the beam splitter. If the peaks line up with the, with the troughs, all the waves will cancel, and you can get all the light, none of the light, and everything in between depending on the path length difference. <coughs> now, Weiss understood that this was a good way to make this measurement, but more importantly, he understood that you couldn't do this with a meter scale instrument. Weiss understood very early on that you would have to make this instrument very long, and he proposed, in fact, to make it four kilometers long. And then in that case, the change in distance that would have to be measured is 10 to the minus 18 meters. That's only a 1,000 times smaller than a single proton, and he told us in 1968 that's doable. And by 1972, he had worked out in detail how to do it. So the LIGO detectors that were born came out of, out of the work of, of, of Weiss in, in, in between 68 and 72. And in fact, here they are in their glory. So in, in 1975, Ray Weiss met Kip Thorne, and together they coined up the, uh, the, the idea that one should build these four kilometer long interferometers to measure gravitational waves. Here is the cartoon I'd shown earlier. Here are the real objects right here, aerial views. They're four kilometers long, one in Washington State and one in Louisiana. Now, in terms of how you get LIGO to work, you need to do two things. And you have to do them very well, but really, in principle, two things. So what's the principle of measurement of LIGO? What LIGO does is, as a gravitational wave passes by, it changes the distance between mirrors, and we want to measure those, those, those changes in distance. Now, what that means is that we have to make sure that the mirrors don't move by more than the gravitational wave would like to move them. Now, a typical object, if I just plopped a mirror down right here in the middle of this stage, and I didn't do much else with it, you have any guess as to how much it would move by? Too much, yes, by, but by a, a, a lot too much. So typically in, 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 a, in a space like this, uh, you know, maybe tens of, 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 of nanometers, tens to hundreds of nanometers, depending on air currents, et cetera. And so the mirrors of LIGO, if you do nothing, move by about one micron. So 10 to the minus 6 meters. The measurement we need to make is 10 to the minus 18 meters. So that's your first factor of a trillion. You have to isolate the mirrors from external forces by a factor of a trillion. And we do that by, by sophisticated vibration isolation systems like this one. And that, uh, that's a, this is basically like the shock absorbers in our cars, or even more accurately, these are like noise cancellation headphones. We measure the, 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 the motions of, of, the, of the ground around these platforms on which the mirrors are mounted, and then we push back and cancel them out. We do that, and we also hang the mirrors as pendulums. And that gives us passive isolation. And between those two, two technologies, we can get a mirror that's, about, that's still to about the level of 10 to the minus 18 meters. Now, it turns out that you could do that, and we do. But that would do you absolutely no good if you didn't know also how to measure very small motions. So, the measurement is made using lasers. That's the L in LIGO. The wavelength of the light that we use is about one micron. The measurement we want to make is 10 to the minus 18 meters. That's your second factor of a trillion. The statement I just made is basically saying, I want to make a measurement that's a trillion times smaller than the tick marks on my ruler. Okay. And the way we do that is by using lots and lots of, of photons, very high-power lasers, 
and in enhancing the power uh, in, in the interferometers so that we can average over many, many, many photons. And that's, a, that's the, the, the technique that's used to make the measurement. So you do those two things. You make your mirrors very still, and you, you, you get a good light source, and you've got yourself a LIGO. Okay? This was funded in the United States over many decades by the National Science Foundation. And, and Barry Barish, our third Nobel laureate, is credited with, with be building the LIGO observatories. OK, now I put this up. This is an expert alert. I'm trying to hear, so the one place where I, I, I thought here I am in the optics uh, and photonics community. So I should really put up here what are the feats of LIGO. So I'm going to speak in very broad brush strokes. The people who really care about such numbers can look at them in detail. But let me tell you some things about LIGO. The power that's stored in the interferometer is nearly a megawatt. The mirrors of LIGO weigh 40 kilograms. They, are, they have the flattest uh, uh, surfaces of, of mirrors uh, made for optical wavelengths uh, you know, or near-infrared wavelengths. The vacuum system of LIGO is, holds about 10 to the minus 8 tor hydrogen over 20,000 cubic meters. So this is really nothing but a laundry list of all the feats that LIGO had to do to make itself work, not just those two factors of a trillion in broad breadstrokes. strokes. And I'll leave it at that, just so I, I put this up so the ex experts could say, wow, so this is your moment. Good. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Good. Now, LIGO is not the only game in town. There's uh, two US interferometers. And then uh, there's a three kilometer detector that's operational in Europe, in, in Italy. It's a French Italian uh, collaboration. There's a three kilometer detector under construction in Japan and a planned detector in India, and also a planned space observatory. Okay. Now we fast forward to September 14, 2015, when LIGO recorded its first uh, signal, and that came from the collision of two black holes. And by the way, the, this name here re represents gravitational wave in the year 2015, the ninth month, the 14th day. That's how these are, are named. And here we have two black holes that orbited each other and, and collided just as Einstein instructed them to. The gravitational waves propagated out into the universe, and they actually traveled a, 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 a large distance. And as you can see, as this wave is spreading out, it's, it lose, it's a, attenuating its amplitude as one over the distance as it comes. And then it arrives at our beautiful planet, first at the Louisiana Observatory, and then seven milliseconds later it, at the Washington. And indeed, this is the discovery that shook the world. But let me tell you, it did not shake the world by this much. <laughs> and here is what the, 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 this now iconic data looks like. These bumps and wiggles of this data, as a function of time, this is the amplitude of the gravitational wave, these are the ripples of space time. You have to sit for a moment and look at this. Even though these are recorded here on, on a screen, you're directly observing the ripples of space time. Look at this, the scale. The amplitude, the peak amplitude of the wave when these two black holes touched was about 10 to the minus 21. It's a big check mark for Kip Thorne. He told us that in the 1960s. The amount by which the LIGO mirrors moved when this the signal was recorded was a few times 10 to the minus 18 meters. Check mark for Ray Weiss. He also told us that in, in the 1960s in, and early 70s. Now, what do we learn from this signal? Well, uh, in a very cartoonish way, you, there's three, ways you, uh, three things you can take away from this. From the, fact, from the frequency evolution, from the fact that the frequency of this wave is changing with time, we can infer the masses of the, uh, uh, of the black holes. From the amplitude, we can infer how far they are. And then finally, from looking at this, la this decay, the frequency and decay time, we can tell what the mass and spin of the newly formed, the final black hole was. So here are the two, two components, and eventually they form a single black hole. And we can tell a lot about the system from these, from these uh, data. And in fact, when we do that, we, 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 if we put these two black holes in a star field, I particularly like this this video, because this was using the same technology that Kip Thorne used for the movie Interstellar. 
Now, our black holes were not in a star field, but had they been, that's what the star field would look like. And you can see these bright rings around the black hole, which is basically light that has been, uh, has been deformed by the, the space-time deformation to be, go around the black hole. What we learned was that these black holes were 1.3 billion uh, light years away. They orbited each other and collided, as those space-time ripples told us. We also learned that what their properties were. They were about 30 times the mass of our sun. At the moment that these two black holes collided, they were moving at half the speed of light. This is a, just something you have to sort of pause and think about. 30 solar mass objects moving at half the speed of light. This is, this is a case where nature is stranger than any fiction we could imagine. They were 13, uh, 1.3 billion light years away. And then remarkably, the new black hole that was formed was three times the mass of our sun lighter than the two parents. So three times the mass of our sun was emitted away in gravitational waves in those 200 milliseconds. Now, we also know that these, uh, the two black holes did not live happily ever after. But, like, uh, but there was something good that came out of them. Those two parents gave up their lives for this newly formed black hole, very much like parents here on the Earth do, right? <laughs> So, you know, the, the cycle of life occurs everywhere. Now, since then, there have been a number more collisions. So after that very first one, there have been nine other black hole collisions observed. And if I had been talking to you two days ago, I would have said to you there have been only five other collisions. So in the last day, the LIGO and Virgo collaborations have announced four new black hole observations that we found in, in, the, in, the, in, in the data we've taken over the last two years. Now, you can see they're all listed just by the dates on which, they were, on which they were recorded. And here is sort of a gallery of them. And I'm not going to go into the details of them other than to tell you that, uh, a few fun things. So that's the very first one, the one I already showed you in detail. And uh, it turns out that it's among the heaviest we've seen. And it's, it's not the farthest and not the closest, but it still remains the loudest one in our, in our data. So it has the, the most significant signal in our data. This one uh, is the spinniest. The black holes can spin about their axis. Uh, no, this is not the spinniest. It's, all, it's spinny. This is a very interesting object. This one was seen on, on July 29th of 2017. It turns out it's the heaviest, it's the farthest, and it's the spinniest. Okay? And this particular one is the, the one that's best localized. So this is just to tell you we are starting to learn about the properties of these black holes and, and, and the more that we see, the more we'll be able to tell you what black holes do. Can I hold questions till the end, please? Thank you. So just because we ha I know we have to get out of the room. Okay, good. Now here is something else that we can tell about these black hole systems. So in blue are the LIGO-Virgo detected black holes. And what they are is, in each case, you can see here are two component black holes that merge into a heavier black hole. And that's how you interpret these, this plot in units of, of solar masses. And you see something quite striking, which is that the blue dots are the black holes that we have known by looking at electromagnetic radiation. And remember, those are black holes we only see if they're sitting in gas or dust or accreting from another companion. Whereas the, these ones are observed purely, the blue ones are observed purely in gravitational waves. And you can see right away that we're observing uh, a population of black holes that are heavier than the ones already known. And that kind of gives us a, a flavor of the kinds of conundrums that we have. A discovery only opens up new questions. So what do we know about black holes so far? Well, we know that Einstein's theory seems to be correct. We know that the, tra the waves seem to travel at the speed of light. We, and the waves seem to have the expected geometry. These are some of the tests we've done with the set of, of, of signals we already have. Remarkably, black holes exist, and they even form pairs. We didn't know that to be, to be true until we observed these black holes. We also are starting to get a handle on how often a black hole, uh, uh, a pair of black holes will, will merge, and that's a, 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 the number. It's a 10 to 100 per cubic uh, gigaparsec per year. So that's sort of just in, in, a, in, a, in, in, a, in a volume uh, of the universe. Now we have some questions. How does nature make such heavy black holes? We don't fully know the answer to that. How do they form pairs? We don't even know the answer to that. We have some conjecture, 
that they could either form in pairs uh, as, as single black holes hanging out in space, and they meet each other, and, and, and because of their gravitational attraction, they dynamically capture each other. The other alternative is that they're born as twins. They're born from binary stars that were already orbiting each other, and then when each of those stars goes supernova, the binary doesn't disrupt. Now, we don't really know the answer to, to, to those questions, but by looking at the spins of the black holes, we might be able to answer some of those questions. So I'll give you an example. If these black holes were just individual black holes in space and they gravitationally met each other, there's no reason for their spins to be aligned. Their spins should be randomly oriented relative to each other and to their or orbital plane. On the other hand, if they were born from a, a pair of binary stars that were already orbiting each other, the angular momentum and mass transfer would make it very hard for their spins not to be aligned. So that's a way in which we might be able to answer this question. Are the spins aligned or they're not? The answer is with the data we have so far, it's too hard to tell. But as we get more, we should be able to say more. Now I want to highlight just one of the, this, this, one other of this, this uh, uh, collection of black holes that I showed you. And that was one that was observed on August 14, 2017. And it's a special one, because it's the first time that both the LIGO detectors and the Virgo detector were operational with these sensitivities. And the only thing to take away from a picture like this is that the purple is Virgo. The higher the curve, the less sensitive it is. So Virgo is not quite as sensitive as LIGO. And you can see in these plots here that you can see that the peak in, in, in at LIGO, Louisiana, was the largest because it was the most sensitive instrument. A little smaller bump in, in, in LIGO Hanford wa in, at Washington, and then a small bump in Virgo. But the amazing thing about having Virgo join the network was that for the first time, we could localize the object in the sky. Now, gravitational wave detectors are, are like our ears. They don't, they, they pinpoint the source by triangulation, which means the more detectors you have over the, a larger baseline, the more precisely you can, you can localize them. And so in this plot, you see all the, the, the localizations that were done with LIGO two detectors alone. And now here we have this new object that was seen with Vir Virgo as well. And Virgo's ability to help localize made a huge difference. With LIGO alone, we would have been able to localize this object to about 1,200 square degrees in the sky. But along with Virgo, we were able to, to pinpoint that it's somewhere in a 60 square degree patch of sky. Now you might ask, why is that so exciting? And that's exciting because astronomers, if they're to point telescopes to look for these objects, telling an astronomer to look for an object in a 1,200 square degree patch of sky, it, it, it's laughable. And, uh, you know, worse, and uh, in fact, they can't do it. And as a result, the more accurately we can localize where a source is, the more likely it is that astronomers can find it. Now, in the case of these black holes, we don't expect to see much light because they, they're, we, expect, we think they're pretty old systems. They've already eaten up all the gas and dust around them. They're just gravitational objects. But nature was incredibly amazing to us, and three days after this triple detection of a, uh, of a black hole system, we saw the collision of two neutron stars. Now, neutron stars, remember, they're lighter cousins of black holes, but there's another really important difference. Neutron stars are made of neutrons. And when neutrons collide, that's where you, you fuse heavy elements and, uh, you, and gives off a lot of light. A lot of energy is released in the process. So we expect a collision of neutron stars to be followed by a light show. And indeed, that's what happened. So here now is, is the signal seen by LIGO and, 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 and Virgo. As a function of time, this is the frequency. So classic chirp, frequency is increasing, the amplitude is increasing. You can see this curve getting darker. And the thing that was remarkable and that told us this was likely to be a neutron star is look at the time scale. For all the black holes, the time scale is a few hundred milliseconds. For a black hole, this is over a minute. And that tells us that it's a light system that's, that's taking its time uh, you know, evolving through our band. 1.7 seconds after the, the LIGO-Virgo uh, trigger that saw this, this uh, uh, merger, 
a gamma ray telescope, the Fermi gamma ray telescope, saw a bright signal as well. And this, together with, with the localization that, that LIGO could do, LIGO and Virgo together could do, was this patch of sky, about 40 square degrees. And an alert was sent out to all astronomers that LIGO and Virgo have seen what we think is a neutron star merger. And then what followed is something what I like to call an astronomer or a physicist's night to remember. So when this, this signal was observed in, in, in LIGO and in Virgo, it was uh, localized to the southern hemisphere. And it was daytime in the southern hemisphere. So astronomers had roughly 12 hours to prepare to point southern hemisphere telescopes to this 40 square degree patch of sky. And they did. And indeed, uh, this is a very busy plot. I want you to just take away two things from it. Notice that no matter what ba uh, band you look in, something was seen. So it starts with gravitational waves, gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, optical, infrared, radio. So every wavelength of light saw something at different times. Now this is a, 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 a images of the galaxy NGC 4993. And notice every one of these different telescopes has a crosshair on this object here. This on the left corner is the time after the LIGO trigger. And now I'll zoom in on this particular one, DLT40. It's a telescope. And notice 20 days earlier, there's nothing in the crosshairs. Something lit up in the sky that night. And that was the, 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 the first time that we were able to observe light and gravity together from the same object. And we learned a few things. But before that, we must have a little musical interlude. Here is a pair of neutron stars orbiting each other, giving off only gravitational waves. And then they collide. And at that moment, there's a, these are the gamma ray jets that are going up. And now here is where all the heavy elements have been fused. And that gives off a more isotopic radiation. That will be the optical of the infrared, etc. So maybe one more time, just, just um, without me talking at you. Just take it in. It's, it's, it's artistic and, and dramatic. Now here was some spectroscopy that was done on this. And the thing that you see as a function of time as, as, uh, is each of these peaks corresponds to the fusion of heavy elements. So that was another thing that was seen by the, by the optical telescopes uh, in, in real time as, uh, as the number of days went by was that in this collision, as all these neutrons collided, heavy elements were being fused. And that was a, a, a long-standing mystery that this, this uh, observation shed light on. So let's talk a little bit about, about, about that. So this observation, there's a number of beautiful things that came out of this single observation. I'll just l name three for you. For a long time, for, for maybe as much as three decades, there's been a mystery as to what this a particular kind of gamma ray burst was. Remember I told you immediately after LIGO's trigger, the Fermi satellite saw gamma ray trigger. So gamma rays come in two classes. They are either short or long. And the dividing line is two seconds. If they're longer than two seconds, people understood, astronomers understood those to be due to supernovae explosions, like the one I showed you at the very beginning. The ones that are shorter than two seconds, we didn't know what they were due to, but there was, it was long suspected that they must be due to neutron star collisions. And for the first time, we could see that they were, because because of the, the, the way that the LIGO trigger and, and, and the gamma ray uh, observations came. So this is a first confirmation that it's, it's, it's likely that neutron star mergers are the cause of these short duration gamma ray bursts. Another long standing mystery here on our planet believe it or, or not, is that we have too much gold. Now, what that really means is that we have more gold than we would expect could be produced in our sun. If you ask where do most of the elements that, the, that, that, that are here on the Earth come from, our nearest neighbor that produces elements is the sun. 
Now it turns out for, for elements heavier than iron, the sun can't produce them, just doesn't have enough neutrons. So we knew they had to come from somewhere else, and the, 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 the idea was that they, maybe they came from supernovae, and we can measure how many el how elements are made in supernovae, and you still can't explain the abundance of gold, platinum, lanthanide series, all those heavier elements. We have too much of that here on the Earth. And those spectra that I showed you tell us for the first time that indeed elements like gold and platinum are formed in neutron star mergers. So that's another mystery that, 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 get, that gets some light shed on. And then finally, there's a third thing that this observation could do for us, and that is to do with measurement of the Hubble constant. Now, the Hubble constant, most of you either have never heard of, or if you have, you've never cared. Let me tell you why you should care. You should care about the Hubble constant because it determines the history and the future of the universe. Okay? So we'd like to know what it is. And it turns out that observations using light, and diff two different methods of observations using, using you know, astronomical methods using uh, light observations give us two different answers. And so a third way that we might be able to determine this, this constant, which determines the expansion rate of the universe, would be by looking at gravitational waves. And we were able to do that with this neutron star uh, merger. And we found an answer that's this number, but more importantly than the fact that it's 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec is that it is in the same ballpark as the two measurements that don't agree with each other. And as our me we measure more neutron stars and we get greater accuracy, the gravitational wave observations will be able to weigh in and maybe even break the impasse between these two other uh, uh, observation methods. So I want to conclude by just telling you that I do believe that, this is an, uh, that a new era of gravitational wave astrophysics is launched. And let me tell you why. So, these were the first direct observations of gravitational waves. Look, like I told you before, these bumps and wiggles are ripples of the space-time itself. Einstein's theory of general relativity seems to be working all right so far for the, the systems that we've seen. Binary black hole and neutron star collisions can be observed in real time, and we can re really learn new things about the universe from that. And then personally, as someone who's worked on the experiment and the instrument for all of my career, it's really nice that the damn instrument also works. <laughs> and it works at the required precision, okay? But you know, I, I will predict that in 100 years, this is not what people will remember. Really what the, 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 the importance of this moment is that for the first time, we've opened a completely new way in which to observe the universe, and in fact, for the first time, we can use gravity alone or with light, as we saw in the case of neutron stars, as a new tool for discovery. And so if you think back to how astronomy pro progressed, we believe Galileo was the first person to uh, point a telescope at the sky. That was in 1609. And Galileo's telescope was a small one and a half inch telescope. Most toy stores telescopes can do better than that now. Most people don't remember what Galileo saw in his telescope. He saw phases of Venus, he saw craters on the moon. What Galileo did and what he's really remembered for is the paradigm shift. He was for the first time told us we humans don't need to just rely on our naked eyes to look at the universe, we can use instruments. And since then we've built spectacular instruments. We have 100 inch telescopes here on the Earth, we've put 100 inch telescopes in space, we're building 25 meter glass telescopes, 25 to 30 meter glass telescopes here on the Earth. We've also opened up every other wavelength of, of light from infrared to gamma ray to X-ray to radio. We've done all these amazing things in the 400 years since Galileo pointed the first telescope at the sky. And I will leave you with this thought that the gravitational wave sky is similar. Like light, gravitational waves span 20 orders of magnitude in wavelength. And what we've done is with these terrestrial interferometers like LIGO and Virgo, we've looked at the fastest objects, things like neutron stars and, and you know, stellar mass black holes. We know that the universe has other emitters. The space observatory, LISA, for example, will be able to measure at, fre at fre uh, frequencies LIGO's 
uh, and Virgo's best frequency of measurement is around 100 hertz. For Lisa, it will be more uh, uh, like, like 10 to 100 uh, millihertz, where you can measure supermassive black holes, really heavy black holes that aren't moving at 100 hertz. And similarly, with other techniques like pulsar timing and the cosmic microwave background uh, polarization, we should be able to map out the, the, the full spectrum of gravitational waves as well. And that's the thing you, sh you have to look forward to, that we will map out the gravitational wave sky. Maybe it'll take us 400 years too, but it'll be a great ride. Thank you. <laughs>